So, uh, like Malika said, I'm an atomic physicist, so you might be wondering what I'm doing here. So, uh, what I'll be doing is basically telling you about an emerging story in cold atoms, how to start to introduce electromagnetism to these cold atoms, and to study many of the topological phenomena that um, you've already heard about and will be hearing about in the summer school. So, I'm an experimentalist, so I'll be covering this from an experimentalist point of view, focusing on the experiments and um, show you some of the techniques that we have in cold atoms, how they might be different from what you see in condensed matter. So here's an outline of uh, my talks. There's going to be two talks, this one and another one that I'll uh, give on Friday. So I'll start, uh, since I know most of you are condensed matter physicists, not atomic physicists, so I'll, I'll give you a brief introduction uh, to the systems we use. So I'll tell you about, um, I'll give you basically a crash course in cold atoms. And uh, then I'll tell you, I'll go chronologically through the different techniques that people have um, gone through to try to introduce uh, topological phenomena to these systems, starting with a technique of just rotating the quantum gas, a very simple technique uh, that um, people have been investigating for a while, but it's, it turns out it runs into some uh, problems. So they've started looking at some newer techniques recently like laser dressing and introducing optical lattices to engineer topological band structures. So the stuff in black I'll be covering uh, today and the stuff in blue I'll continue on Friday. So basically today I'll try to end on optical lattices and how you can make topological band structures and measure the associated very phases for these band structures using atom interferometry. And then on Friday, uh, what I'll do is I'll show you how to start with, uh, uh, with lattices that do not have any associated topology, but then to, introduce, to add topology to them and tell you about experiments that have realized uh, very fundamental models like the Hofstadter model or the Haldane model using these ideas and how they measured in these experiments churn numbers um, using both topological currents and uh, some very recent stuff on edge states. And then I'll switch to non-abelian gauge fields and tell you about spin orbit coupling and current attempts people, uh, current efforts towards realizing topological superfluidity by combining these uh, spin orbit couplings with very strong interactions. All right, so let me start by introducing the systems. So these cold atom systems, what I want you to imagine is a vacuum chamber that has a very dilute gas in it. And uh, the gas typically is an alkali atom, although people have um, cooled gases all over the periodic table to degeneracy. So things like rubidium, lithium, potassium, or cesium. In my lab here at Princeton, we have a lithium. The species can be bosonic or fermionic. So those are composite particles, of course, these atoms. So they can, have, uh, they can be bosons or fermions. And the densities we typically work with are on the order of 10 to, to the 13 per cubic centimeter. So the limit there is set by inelastic collisions. So if you, um, if you have a dense gas, then you have a high frequency of three particles coming together, which can lead to molecular formation, molecule formation, and that would lead uh, to the loss of the molecules. So if you want to keep our gas stable, we need to have just sufficient collisions that there's a favorable elastic to elastic uh, collision ratio. So that you can have the interactions, thermalization, etc., but not processes that would lead to the formation of molecules. So the typical spacing corresponding to this density between the atoms is about half a micron or so. So those gases are very dilute, a million times thinner than air. And what that means for studying quantum mechanics is that we need to cool these gases to very low temperatures. So quantum mechanics kicks in, of course, once the wave functions, so if this is the de Broglie wave function here for an atom, once that becomes comparable to the interparticle spacing, that's, one, when, that's the point at which we reach uh, a degeneracy and start to observe quantum phenomena. 
So if you plug in the numbers for a typical atom like rubidium, if you plug in the mass here for rubidium uh, and ask what's the temperature at which the de Broglie wavelength matches the interparticle spacing of about half a micron, the temperatures you get are on the order of 100 nanokelvin to a microkelvin. So extremely low temperatures. And so we have to be creative about techniques to get that cold. So you probably are used to things like Dilfridges and so on, but we need to get much colder than what you can achieve. Uh, with Dilfridges. So you need to get down to these nanokelvin temperatures. And what people have done over the past couple of decades I is. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I don't understand what you mean by degeneracy. Uh, well, I've just defined it when the interparticle. Uh, I mean, basically, once. Um, uh, like when say for, for a Fermi gas, you would have the temperature uh, much less than the Fermi temperature. Much less than the what? Than the Fermi temperature of the gas or for bosons much less than the critical uh, temperature for Bose-Einstein condensation. Okay? So, uh, and that's given by the condition that the interparticle spacing has to be comparable to the de Broglie wavelength. Okay? Okay, so the, we have a few cooling techniques in our bag. The first one is laser cooling. And uh, laser cooling relies basically on the fact that these atoms are really light, so you can uh, slow them down by bombarding them with photons and uh, transferring basically the momentum of the photon to the atom to slow down the atom. So if you take an atom that's moving at room temperature and start bombarding it with photons, you need roughly about 10,000 photons to slow it down from, um, from moving at uh, the jet speeds it typically has at uh, room temperatures down to almost, to almost a rest. Of course, you might ask, why doesn't this start moving in the other direction? So there we make use of the Doppler shift. So the trick is here, if you imagine a two-level atom, and you shine a laser beam on it that is tuned at a frequency below the resonance, then the atom that is moving towards your laser beam will see a higher frequency, and this uh, means that it goes on resonance, and this atom will, absor will scatter photons and slow down, while if it's moving away from you, it won't absorb any, any light. Of course, this is not as discrete as I've been describing. Basically, the Doppler shift varies continuously as the atom slows down. So we need to keep the light on resonance the whole time to slow it down. So here's a device we have, for example, in my lab. It's called the Zeeman slower, which achieves this. You start with a source of atoms, uh, typically a, a chunk of metal which you heat up to produce a vapor, pass it through a, th a hole that produces an effusive beam, and then this beam travels down a tube, and you shine a laser from the other side that slows down the atoms. And to keep the atoms continuously on resonance as their Doppler shift changes, we just have a, a solenoid here which produces a spatially varying magnetic field, which through the Zeeman shift keeps the atoms on uh, resonance. And this way we can end up with atoms slowing down from 1,000 meters per second down to maybe a few 10 meters per second. And that's slow enough at that point that we can capture them in a trap. So here's a typical trap we use, for example, in my lab. It's called a magneto-optical trap. Um, if you imagine shining laser beams from six orthogonal directions on the atoms, all of which are detuned below the atomic resonance, then you can cool in all these directions. So you have a viscous force in all the directions that localizes the atoms in momentum space but we'd also lo like to localize them in real space so they get trapped. So we add to this configuration uh, two, two coils that are in a quadruple configuration that has a zero of the magnetic field at this point here. And what that does is in combination by, if, if, we, if we are careful about picking the polarizations of the lasers here, we can basically make the atoms selectively absorb from one of the beams or the other. So for example, if they move this way, they can selectively absorb from this beam, which has the correct polarization for driving a transition, and push it back. So we can create a restoring force on the atoms and trap them. Okay? This is a rather de technical, technical details here. I don't want to go too much into it. But basically, the end result is we have a cloud of atoms in a vacuum chamber that looks like this. This is a very macroscopic blob of atoms, uh, roughly maybe a few millimeters big here. And it contains about a billion atoms, but it's scattering so much light that you can see it with your bare eyes. And this is actually a picture taken with a cell phone camera. 
Okay? So, um, and the atoms already at this point, through laser cooling, have been cooled down to millikelvin temperatures. Okay? This happens within milliseconds. You, you bring them down to, to millikelvin temperatures through this laser cooling technique. Now, however, the temperature is still too hot for degeneracy, and we'd like to get colder. And the limit now is the fact that they're scattering photons. So although those photons cool them down, the fact that you're still scattering photons means there's always some residual momentum for the atoms. So to get even colder, we need to switch off the light. We need to put the atoms in the dark. And for that, we have to load them into a conservative trap, one that doesn't involve spontaneous scattering of photons. And we have a couple of tools to get there. One is a magnetic trap. So you can engineer a configuration of magnetic fields which has a minimum in space somewhere. And then because the atoms have a magnetic spin, a uh, magnetic moment, they can end up in the, in, if you put them in the correct state, they can end up in the minimum and get trapped there. Another technique which we use in my lab is an optical trap, which uh, basically acts very much like in biology an optical tweezer. You just focus the laser beam down to a tight spot and you p use a wavelength that's very far from the atomic resonance, so there's no scattering of photons. So the light only interacts with the atoms through the AC Stark shift. Basically, the electric field of the light induces a dipole moment on the atoms, and that dipole moment interacts again with the electric field to produce a shift of the energy, and the atoms have the lowest energy if they sit, for example, at the focus of this uh, laser beam. So they can get trapped in this conservative optical trap. Once we trap them in the dark, we can now reduce the depth of the trap to kick out the hotter atoms. For example, in an optical trap, all you do is turn down the light intensity. So th there's a lower trap depth and the hot atoms escape. And through this evaporative cooling process, you can get down to these nanokelvin temperatures. So this sequence of combining first the laser cooling and evaporative cooling is uh, the sequence that got these gentlemen here the Nobel Prize in 2001. Uh, they these two here at Jilla, Eric Cornell and Carl Wyman, cooled, uh, achieved the Bose-Einstein condensate of rubidium, and Wolfgang Ketterle at MIT achieved the Bose-Einstein condensate of sodium in 1995. And um, basically using the, re the exact recipe I've described so far. So you might ask, how do you observe the Bose-Einstein condensate? Well, it's, it's quite simple, actually. What you do is you start with the atoms in the trap, and you release them. Okay, so here's the trap cloud, and we just let it expand. We switch off the light. So once they expand, we can shine a resonant light beam at the atoms, and the photons, uh, the atoms scatter away some photons from this beam and cast a shadow. And this shadow can be imaged onto a camera. Okay, so here it is. From this shadow, we can extract information about the number of atoms, knowing the cross-section of the scattering of the photons. We can also extract information about the temperature of the cloud, knowing how fast the cloud is expanding. Okay? So we can basically characterize the essential quantities in this cloud. And, for example, in these pictures from uh, the Ketterle group at MIT, what they saw was, as you cool the gas, there's something interesting happening in these time-of-flight pictures. At high temperatures, they see the shadow, which has a Gaussian shape, which reflects the fact that in momentum space here, what you're seeing is basically the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. As you cool the gas further, there's a dense core that appears. This dense core is basically, once you've crossed the critical temperature, there's a macroscopic occupation of the ground state, the Bose-Einstein condensate. And um, those atoms don't move much during the time of flight, so they appear as this dense core that coexists with the thermal cloud. And then if you cool further, you can achieve a pure Bose-Einstein condensate. So it's a lot of work to get to something that's like liquid helium, or, or if you do this with a degenerate fer with, with Fermi gases, um, you get something like electronic matter in a solid. But that's the starting point of these experiments. Yeah? What's the of the gas? No, so those are destructive experiments. You, you, uh, do the experiment, you image, you've lost the quantum gas at that point. So you just do this all over again. Typical cycle times are from 10 to 30 seconds. Yeah. Uh, so wh why, um, you know, it looks like it's like spatially localized or something. Is that really, is that what I expect the grounds, you know, if I'm on the atom, like, 
Yeah, if, if so there is it in the center, you know, isn't that right? Shouldn't it be some plane wave or something? You know, it shouldn't be spread out everywhere. So this is a trapped Bose Einstein condensate. It's not like your usual, you know, the, the usual textbook picture in a box. So, so this is in a harmonic trap. If it were also, if it was completely Bose condensed in momentum space, it would be a point. Uh, here, the interactions lead to some broadening of the of the size of the cloud. Okay. So the, both the trap, the fact that you have a finite confinement and you, the fact that you have interactions brought in it, but otherwise you expect to see, if you had no interactions and a very fluffy trap, you'd expect to see a point in the center of this picture. Is this a momentum space? This is a momentum space picture, yes. Uh, I see, I see. This is af after releasing, basically, the atoms are traveling some distance which is proportional to their velocity. And so this is a momentum space picture. You're just seeing momentum space. Here. You drew it on that picture, you know, I mean, it's, just, it's a real space cloud that's like blocking the laser, you know. Yeah, but so, uh, the, the, what's important is the step before. I released them from the cloud, from, from the trap. <coughs> so, so basically, position is getting, um, their velocity is getting mapped to a position. Right, like if, after some long time, if they have some velocity that gets converted to some large position, the hotter they are, the further they travel. Okay. Okay, so to study condensed matter physics, uh, in the early days, what people, when they started uh, playing with these condensates and Fermi gases, mostly they were thinking about things like atom lasers, because this looks a lot, this post Einstein condensate looks a lot like a laser beam, essentially, um, a coherent matter wave. But the thing that actually started steering the field towards condensed matter is starting to add optical lattices to these cold atoms. So what that is, is basically you take a laser beam, and reflect it off a mirror, and that creates a standing wave. Okay, the standing wave, you can shine on the atoms, and through the AC-Stark shift, this modulated intensity pattern becomes a modulated potential that the atoms move in. Okay? So they acquire a band structure, just like electrons in a solid. And this can happen in higher dimensions. You can shine more laser beams, create this sort of potential. You're not restricted to square or lattices or any, or cubic lattices. You can shine the laser beams in different configurations and create a lot of different lattice geometries. People have done Kagome lattices, uh, whatever your condensed matter lattices is, okay? Yeah, you just shine the laser beam, reflect it off a mirror, and you put your atoms in the, in the path of the light. So this opened up the field of uh, quantum simulations with cold atoms. And what that is, is basically people are after now trying to simulate phenomena that happen in condensed matter systems with cold atoms. And there's a question of why you want to pursue this program. So the reason is basically these cold atom systems are systems that we understand from first principles very accurately. Like we know exactly the microscopic description of the Hamiltonian we're writing down. But once we write down this microscopic Hamiltonian, we don't know how to solve many of these quantum many-body Hamiltonians. So once you go beyond 20 particles or so, theoretical simulations, exact diagonalizations become really hard. So the other reason is we can really engineer these Hamiltonians with a lot of flexibility. Like I showed you already, you can create a lot of lattice geometries, but you can also uh, control a lot of the variables, the parameters of the system in real, even in real time if you want. So for example, if you load the atoms into a lattice, you can tune the tunneling just simply by changing the laser intensity. You change the laser intensity, you change the depth of the potential, and the tunneling and parameters for those atoms changes. You can change things like the interactions. You can, um, uh, I said, change the lattice geometry. You can, as you'll see in this talk, add gauge fields. Essentially, you can engineer a Hamiltonian, almost any Hamiltonian you want. And uh, Another interesting thing is that those are like enlarged condensed matter systems. They're, the typical spacing in the lattice here is a wave like a flight. And the atoms are really heavy. So all the dynamics happens really slowly, typically on a millisecond time scale compared to, I don't know what you have in a condensed matter system, like femtoseconds or so. So you can really observe these easily in the lab. And uh, they are very clean systems with no impurities. If you want to add the impurities, you can add them in a controlled way, okay? So that's the program that a lot of labs around the world are pursuing. But 
One big missing ingredient until recently has been electromagnetism. We didn't have this in these cold atom systems. And the main reason has been that, that those atoms are charge neutral. 